all right, welcome to all you melodies in the world. <laughs> well, uh, we'll have to devise something a little bit easier to, to use maybe the next three Mondays. I'm, I'm not sure I'll have to investigate that. But anyway, welcome to this evening's class on, um, I, I call it uh, basic plant pathology. We're going to talk about identification and control of uh, some of our more common uh, diseases that we see here in uh, Northeast Tennessee. And just as a reference point, we'll, we'll have it videoed and it'll go on YouTube. And then of course, all the supplemental resources will be in the, in the Google Drive. If this is your first night with us, uh, when you get the email later tonight or tomorrow, just request access uh, to the Google Drive and you can have access to all of our classes. Okay, so we'll just dive right in here. And there's a lot of information on this one slide. So, you know, when we start talking about plant disease, uh, we can do it in either, either the broad sense or the, or the narrow sense. And I, I put it to you like that because um, as you heard me talk about last week or have heard me talk about in several classes, you know, Mother Nature has thrown us a curveball. So many of the things that we are, are experiencing right now, um, just a few calls today, as a matter of fact, are just um, at her hand, basically. We're we're kind of at, at her mercy. And some of the things that we see throughout the rest of this growing season are gonna be impacted by, by the environment and certain stressors. Uh, but we are gonna show you some pictures of some basic um, viruses, bacteria, fungi, some of those type plants, again, that are gonna be more popular here in East Tennessee. So uh, to start us out with, of course, we need to talk about the disease triangle because for disease to, to occur, all three of these things need uh, to be present. We, we need to have that, pest itself and we need to have a host and then of course we need to have an environment that's going to be conducive uh, to that infection or infestation. But if we alter one of those sides of that triangle then we can um, actually get a different response from the pathogen itself. So for instance if we make that environment less conducive to infection for a fungal organism to thrive, say we reduce overhead watering in the garden. We don't overhead water, we water right at the soil line, then we can significantly reduce the area within this triangle that represents uh, the amount of disease severity on our plant. And if we can completely eliminate then one side of that triangle, then like, like just using resistant cultivars, for instance, then we can completely eradicate a host for that pathogen to be present, right? So we're still going to have a conducive environment and that pathogen is still going to be there. It's just that we're not giving it a, a place to thrive and live and reproduce. So when it comes to plant disease in the garden, and we're going to speak specifically to garden, even though a lot of this could um, be similar in orchard situations, vineyards, and even our home landscapes, um, but for tonight, most of it, we're, we're going to focus on the garden. But, but why do we care? Because obviously we're going to be reducing that quantity and quality of our food that we're, like, just like John said, it's hot out there today and we're spending a lot of sweat, blood and tears, money uh, growing a garden. Uh, we want to make sure that that food supply that we're growing is going to be safe. You know, there's some uh, things within some chemical reactions within our plants. Think about a green potato, for instance, that can can build up some toxicity levels. Um, aesthetically, it can just be ugly when we get disease in our, our gardens, and it's just an economic loss. So uh, when we think about diseases overall, um, when we look at the, the entire plant, root rots are going to interfere with uh, water and nutrient absorption. That's going to cause death and destruction for that whole plant. If we get a stem disease, then of course those can alter the stability of that plant. Um, anytime there's a leaf spot or a blot, which we see very common here in East Tennessee, then that disrupts photosynthesis, which is that plant's way of making food source. And then if we have a fruit infection, then that alters that, um, that storage of foods or think about the, the sugar to starch conversion in our, in our food that we're growing. So to kick us off, um, you've heard me say this in many classes, it's like, oh goodness, where do I start? Because we basically have a, maybe an hour and a half tonight and, and there's just way too many diseases in the universe to cover them all. And I wasn't gonna even talk about abiotic plant problems, but again, I think with the weather that we've had in the last month and kind of the, the route that we're, we're moving into this spring, just based on calls and emails, that I should talk about some of these. 
So when we talk about abiotic disorders, that's just usually going to be an issue with too little or too much water. It's going to be a nutritional deficiency. Uh, sometimes it's too much sun, and sometimes it's just going to be uh, cultivar specific. It's going to be that specific time, uh, type of variety. Uh, these are those problems we can't always control. They're outside the, the realm of our scope of control, but it's good to be able to recognize these because sometimes they can be confused with diseases we do need to be managing in the garden. So we'll start out with sun scald. So um, through a tomato up here, because this is the most popular fruit we all grow in the garden, uh, when it's going to be exposed to that hot, dry sun, then it's going to be, it's going to have this white, tan, leathery looking appearance on the surface. And that's, again, where it's just exposed to that sun. You can see how it wrinkles up right here. And this is actually another phenomenon. This is what we call zippering in tomatoes. It's nothing bad for home gardeners, but on a commercial scale, that can actually lead to some economic reductions. But um, sometimes we'll get a black secondary mold that's here that can be confused sometimes with a fungal disease. Um, but the, the bad thing is when we get sun scald to this severity, it can introduce other pathogens that can, be, can become a problem. Uh, this is a pepper plant that's probably been blown over by wind a little bit later in the season, but you can see there that damage is quite extensive. Uh, it's just lack of a foliage canopy. and that fruit there, the, the brown parts, is it's not going to be edible. It's not going to be usable just because that, that skin has, has broken. And we can also find that on, on eggplant. A lot of people don't think about some of those darker skin fruits being affected by sun scald. And then this is sometimes brought in for diagnosis when that's all it is, a sun scald. It's not disease on the cucumber. Uh, cat facing, we talked about this last week. That's just a physiological phenomena. Um, it's usually poor conditions during blossoming that, that leads to poor pollination. And typically, lower temperatures earlier in the season, which is what we've experienced so far, is going to cause this. So I fear we might see some of this in uh, tomatoes that might have been put out earlier in raised beds or containers. Um, sometimes injury from uh, phenoxy-based herbicides or 2,4-D can also cause this phenomena. And then if we really severely prune tomato plants or throw a lot of nitrogen, push a lot of nitrogen fertility, we can also see this. But again, it's not disease. It's going to be edible, um, but we've got to be careful to manage this, make sure that we're picking when they're ripe so we don't introduce other other pathogens. And just an FYI, some of those older heirloom varieties that we all love, those, those beefsteak varieties are going to be um, a little bit more susceptible to this uh, phenomenon. Same thing with um, cracking. That's just going to be caused by soil moisture fluctuations. And I spoke about this a little bit last week, but that's basically when that green fruit uh, or that fruit reaches the green maturity stage and it starts to set color, it, it shuts itself off to grow any further, to enlarge anymore. But what happens if we don't pick that on time and then we get a rainfall or we start pushing irrigation to it again, then that switch gets flipped back on by that fruit and it starts expanding. And that's why we see um, cracking like that. It just causes that fruit to enlarge again, to just start growing. And again, you're going to have um, certain varieties that are going to be more susceptible to that. Again, some of those beefsteak tomatoes, our favorite heirlooms, you're going to see this quite frequently. Uh, we'll see this with peppers later in the season. This is nothing to be alarmed about. Some folks will think this is blight. Um, as long as you can cut around that, because it, it does get a little bit soft, but you can still utilize that if you're freezing. Um, for use or even fresh use. A lot of folks don't think about carrots being affected by that, but if we leave them in ground too long, uh, they too can experience that as well as cabbages, either early spring or late fall when we're harvesting. Uh, blossom end rot, uh, this is a lot more complicated than we think. It's going to be more stress related. It's not necessarily a calcium deficiency. There's, there's really a lot more to that because calcium is one of those macro nutrients. It's not like our NP and K that's in our fertilizer. It's, it's a secondary nutrient. So it resides a lot deeper in the soil line. It's one of those that we don't necessarily always have to put on our gardens, uh, but it's constantly being taken up by the plant through the roots. And it's a dissolved nutrient. So basically what that means is it's traveling first to those active growing points where the new leaves and the shoots are 
are at. So it's basically a calcium shortage to be able to develop this fruit wall is what is occurring. And you can see there just different sizes. It even shows up on the on the green tomatoes. Um, severe pruning can also lead to this. It can stress it out a little bit more. Uh, again, some tomato cultivars are going to be more susceptible, but if you're mulching and providing that uniform and consistent watering, that's really going to help uh, with blossom end rot. And you can see here, it, again, it affects all kinds of fruit. A lot of these we always automatically think about tomatoes, but it is going to affect uh, many different species in the garden. So again, it's, it's nutritional. It, it is a lack of calcium, but it's got to do with moisture fluctuations and soil pH. So it usually occurs when this fruit is just first starting to develop. So when you start to get that first flush of fruit on your tomatoes, on your um, squash, peppers, watermelons, all that. Always be more vigilant at that time because you're going to see that. But um, as the fruit cells break down to due to that lack of calcium, this is what occurs. So what that means is that that plant is not reaching that calcium. And this could be a lot of factors. And a lot of us, we are guilty about doing it. So if we go out there and we water our gardens every day, and especially you folks that are growing in containers or in raised beds, don't water every single day if you if you can help it and if you if you are watering make sure that you're watering deep and uniform around those plants because we want to push the water down because that's where that calcium is residing if we're just shallow watering every day we're promoting those roots to grow along the top of the soil rather than encouraging those roots to to go deep where they can actually access that calcium so another reason that calcium is not going to be available, if it's not our fault on the watering, is going to be the lack of our pH being where it needs to be. So you can see here, normal garden, we want to be in that 6.5 range. This is why soil pH is so critical. Calcium resides about, you know, right in here. So if we start getting down to that 5.5, you can see it's just barely the tips of those roots of that plant that's going to reach that calcium. That's why there's no calcium coming up to that plant. And that's why that fruit can't form that fruit because it just can't take it up. So I say all this to you to just be re real careful. Make sure that you know what your soil pH is because it's not just blossom and rot that this can affect. When we get our pH a little off kilter, it can tie up other nutrients um, in the soil that can lead to deficiencies and toxicities. But this is just an excellent example of why it's so very important to make sure our soil pH is right on, on tap. And again, it's just, there's not enough water there to move that material up through the plant. And you can see that there on young watermelons and on an older watermelon. Uh, we do see it on, on peppers um, as well. Don't use high nitrogen fertilizers like ammonium nitrate. Sometimes uh, we as gardeners get a little, uh, you know, we get excited and we start throwing the nitrogen to it thinking that's really going to uh, spruce up our you know, but well, I started to say tomatoes, any of our garden produce, but more more nitrogen can actually be more detrimental in the long long term. So but be cautious with that. I threw this in here because we get a lot of questions on this in late summer and fall as folks are starting to go can tomatoes. And there's no fancy name for it. We just call it internal white tissue because you can see how that comes falls out in the fruit of that tomato. Uh, this is a hundred percent edible, just cutting out that core and where it's it's white. Um, sometimes you'll see it extend on down to the core and even into the insides a little bit better. Uh, we will see this typically when we have um, high period or extended periods of high temperatures during the ripening period. Again, nothing that that we can really do about that, but um, potassium fertilizer, if we are reading those soil tests and making sure we're making, you know, making sure our potassium levels are adequate, that can help uh, stave off some of this issue. Same thing with leaf curl. This is not disease. It's kind of a blurry picture, but um, sorry about that. But um, you can see it's a it's got the dark green color that we like. There's no leaf spots on that. Um, that right there is 
that little hole is just where that leaf has broken from massive curling. But usually this is just environmental stresses. Sometimes we can have an underlying viral infection or it can be herbicide damage. And you can kind of see this right here, these puckering in the leaves. That's something I would take a little bit closer look at because oftentimes 2,4-D or a phenoxy herbicide will see that puckering. But if we're not seeing that and we're, we're seeing just this leaf roll, that's nothing to get stressed about. If we don't see any accompanying spots, um, that's usually just going to be a stress response. Consider it transplant shock. And like I said, we've already had a lot of calls on this. I think because soil temp wasn't where it needed to be um, early on when we started planting in the garden that first and second week of May. Um, and, and then we had that week of really cool temperatures. We had a week of cloudy overcast. The temperatures were okay, but you know, not a lot of sunlight. Um, our soil temps, it took a little bit longer to reach that than what it usually does. Uh, you know, we, we didn't plant fruit or um, veggie trials at the research center until last week because we didn't have adequate soil temp. And then of course the week before that, it rained the entire week. So um, when we put all those stressors on a plant, um, it's going to cause some leaf curl. So if you see that, don't be, don't be too alarmed. Just keep a, keep a vigilant eye on it. Um, herbicide injury, we see this quite frequently because we've got neighbors that uh, live out in the country or spray in fence rows or pasture fields. Uh, we ourselves are utilizing them for broadleaf weed control in our lawns and our landscapes and sometimes uh, drift can occur or we can have some uh, volatilization. You know, this is a material that can move for miles. Um, Tomatoes, grapes, and tobacco are going to be your three most sensitive crops usually to um, a 2,4-D. Uh, they'll start getting elongated a little bit. They start kind of folding up on themselves. They take on a rubbery-like texture, and they start curling. So we don't like to see this, even though it is kind of cool looking. It almost looks like daughter formation in the top of that plant. Um, and, and oftentimes a, a plant will not recover from something like that. So be real careful when you're when you're applying those broadleaf chemicals. Um, it, it can also be from um, residual if we've applied uh, if, or if we're planting a garden for the first time in a in a hay field or a pasture that's been treated with some of those graze on um, some of those herbicides that will have carryover for extended periods of time we can see this phenomena occur too. And Leaf bleaching, if we ever see that, uh, we'll often suspect some kind of herbicide damage. And then um, there is no pre-emergent herbicide pre-plant that is labeled for home garden use, but this is a commercial picture. I just thought it was a good representation to show you and, and just to discuss the importance of making sure we get a uh, mulch cover underneath our plants. Again, that's going to help us maintain moisture consistency, uh, but it also is going to reduce splash up on those plants. So even um, commercial folks that are using a, a pre-plant can get some herbicide injury and this is just being splashed up from the soil. But this kind of leaf is going to be typical on any plant um, in regards to that herbicide injury anytime we see that puckering. Okay, so that gives you just a brief introduction into some of those physiological kind of issues we're going to see. And so now we're going to move into to the hard stuff and talk about some of these biotic plant um, pathogens, which are living plant organisms or diseases. So um, we usually lump these into four categories. Nematodes is one of those. We're not going to talk about any nematode diseases because that's something we um, don't see here in Northeast Tennessee. So I've omitted that one tonight. And then we also have viruses, fungi, and bacteria. And this chart just shows you the number of species worldwide and then the number of those uh, pathogens within that species. So uh, this is just serves as an illustrative diagram to show you that fungi are going <laughs> to be far out in front of uh, bacteria and viruses as far as causing us uh, some some problems. They are clearly going to dominate um, in the in the pathogenic species as well as number of species. So oftentimes when we think fungi we think about mushrooms and we do have a lot of edible fungi that that, um, that many of us actually enjoy um, 
foraging for um, in the springtime and everything or all throughout the year but uh, for tonight we're going to talk about specific diseases and again we're going to talk about viruses um, fungi and bacteria all separate because each one of those groups are going to have distinct characteristics so when it comes to identifying these that's why it's so important to know what some of those differences are because if we go out and spray our cucumbers for with a fungicide and it's a viral issue then you've thrown time and money and energy out out the door so that's why we got to be um, really extra careful when we go to determining what the the plant pest is so there's a lot of words on here, but basically all this slide um, serves to illustrate is that when you bring in a plant for diagnostics or, you, you know, you call us on the phone or send us pictures, you'll often hear us referring to some of these words, sclerotia or spores, fruiting bodies, um, mycelium or hyphae. And it's not that you need to know what those are, but just recognize when you hear that terminology that, well, that's, that's fungal organisms. Those are fungal structures. Uh, some kind of, you know, vegetative structure that's going to cause me stress in my garden. So um, the cool thing about those are is that with fungi we can usually see these with the naked eye. I mean sometimes we're going to scope those to make sure what the causal organism is, like in the instances of blight, uh, late blight and stuff like that. And and tomatoes, but um, most always we'll be able to see some of these fruiting bodies. So when you become plant detective in your garden, look for some of these clues and we'll talk more about these as we as we move on through tonight. So some of the most common diseases, I've listed those here. I'm, I'm not going to speak much on the wilts because fusarium wilt is something we tend to see more in sandier soils, so think uh, Piedmont coastal Carolina, um, even in the sandier soils here in Greene County and Washington County along the river, it's, it's not going to usually be very conducive for fusarium. And verticillium, both of these actually have um, a lot of resistant cultivars, whether it be tomatoes, cucumbers, whatever. We've, we've pretty well managed to, an, I'm not going to say annihilate, but for the home gardener in this part of the world, these are two that we don't see a lot of. Uh, so we're going to focus a little bit more on some of some of these others. Uh, the thing I want you to know about infection from a fungal pathogen is that you've, you've got to have an opening for that pathogen to infect a plant. So I say that for a couple of reasons. You, you often will hear me utilize the words primary or secondary source of infection. And the reason for that is if we have an insect infestation in our garden, whatever that be, you know, they're going to have little chewing mouth parts or piercing sucking mouth parts. And what they're doing is penetrating that leaf uh, surface, which is, which is opening up what we call a penetration peg for that fungal pathogen um, to enter. And then once it enters, then it's, uh, as long as we have some kind of method for it to uh, sporulate, then, then that's what it's going to do. Usually that's a wet surface. That's why fungal pathogens um, are such an issue in wet periods, and that's not just rain. That can also be um, heavy fogs and heavy dews, humidity. All of those things are going to help drive uh, the occurrence of fungal pathogens. So that's just a slide to show you what those kind of look like under the scope. We won't go into all of that, but uh, to start us out with, I thought I would we start with what we usually refer to as damping off and there's going to be many of these causal agents but Pythium and Phytophthora and then we're going to talk some about a few others here in a few minutes uh, but they're going to be usually the lead suspect when we have damping off or sometimes you'll hear it called stem rot or crown rot so lots of different names we'll hear that. Phytophthora you'll usually hear that more in a landscape setting uh, you'll usually hear it called crown gall um, if, you're, if you grow strawberries, we will uh, refer to that as red steel disease. So all of those are going to be caused by the same pathogen. So um, you can kind of see what that little stem right there, it's just not had a chance um, at all. Uh, the, the bad thing about pythium is that it is a fungal organism in the soil, so um, it, it can attack plants when that soil becomes overwatered or if we're planting in diseased soil. Um, anytime we get warm, humid conditions, it's going, it's going to flourish. So again, that splash contact 
from the soil, you can see a little layer of mulch here. So we've reduced that uh, point of entry from soil splash by doing that. Um, sometimes, again, you'll hear us refer to Pythium as a secondary because we've had some other issue, whether it be in the greenhouse before those transplants or we're growing our own transplants and we didn't have enough light on them. Um, we've caused them to stretch and get leggy, whatever that might be. Um, Pythium is usually going to be a secondary response. And you can see there, you, you hear me say all the time when you buy transplants, to take them, pop them out of that pot and look at the root system. Well, of course, this would be um, surrounded by soil media. Hey, can everybody mute themselves real quick? Just make sure we're muted. I'm getting a little background noise there. Whoops, did I hit the... Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, you can see what those roots would look like. If we popped that out of a soilless container, we would think, well, that root system looks pretty good, right? Uh, but we got to investigate a little bit uh, further, make sure you get kind of intimate when you're investigating transplants. So this is the beginning of what this will eventually look like. And you can see that brown uh, rat tail looking root there. And that's just not going to sustain itself at all. So uh, sometimes even on the soil line of those transplants, again, whether you're purchasing or growing your own, you might even see like a little cottony growth on the top of that soil. Uh, and that can indicate a, a damping off disease as well. This picture will show you um, just how devastating it can be. You can see where it started to scar right here, but we can still see active lesions where that disease is still actively sporulating. Um, and again, we could have multiple pathogens on these three stems. It's not necessarily just gonna be Pythium or, or just Phytophthora. We could have a couple of other species that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. So um, one good indicator of damping off uh, think about if you plant potatoes or anything you're direct seeding in your garden and you don't get a, a really good stand. Uh, that is probably a, a sign that we've got some damping off um, going on. And sometimes that can be because the soil is too heavy or too wet. Um, but when, when those seeds get attacked before they even have a chance to germinate, that or we get this soft mushiness right here, then that's going to be indicative of, of damping off. And so that leads us into Rhizoctonia, or we just call it Rhizoc for short. And I'll put that same picture right back in there because this is another one that can also cause this infection. So again, these are going to be diagnosed uh, early in season together. Sometimes if um, you'll hear us refer to them as stem cankers. If you um, love your lawn and you've ever had brown patch in your lawn, that is caused by Rhizoc. Another indicator of Rhizoc um, is that those plants will tend to wilt during midday. And of course, you can also see what that stem looks like. The stems are gonna rot or decay right there at the soil line. And oftentimes we'll see like a reddish, purple, brown colored lesion um, as well, where that point of entry is. And you can kind of see that a little bit better. So it's completely deteriorating the pith of that um, plant stem and that Pith is what's responsible for xylem and phloem, and phloem is what is transporting all those nutrients to the plant. Well, um, nothing's going to be able to get through that stem, so that's going to be a total loss. So um, you're going to see that there's not a fungicide in the world that's going to cure this. It's going to be all about cultural and sanitation mechanisms. Um, simple things like uh, making sure we water in the morning or um, proper plant spacing, having that good airflow. Uh, we, we don't want any plant stress, which again, Mother Nature threw us a curveball this year. Um, if we're growing any kind of cucurbit crop or a vine crop, if we can grow those vertically, that can help um, defray some of these occurrences too. And you know, this is in lettuce. We'll often see that in, in early sp springtime. And again, just another visual of what that stem lesion is gonna look like. And this is Rhizoc, but it's not necessary to really know, you know, specifically if that was Pythium or if it's Rhizoc, we're gonna treat those all the same. This is what that's gonna look like on, on fruit um, as we move a little later in the season. And then this is a poinsettia plant. So we know how um, expensive growing poinsettias can be. So if something like this were to get loose in a 
greenhouse with poinsettias, it can be pretty devastating. Um, alternaria, this is one you'll hear us refer to quite frequently. Um, you sometimes hear it called just leaf blight or leaf spot. Uh, this is one of those pathogens that's very opportunistic. If we get into those extended periods of wetness, we're going to see this. We've never gone a season that I've lived in Tennessee for 20 years and never not seen this um, pathogen. So um, if, if, if we get into those pro prolonged periods of wetness, then it's, it's going to be an issue for us. So um, one way you can determine if it's alternaria is when you are out being plant detective in your garden. If, if you notice um, some of the symptoms on the older leaves, that's a good indication that it is alternaria. And as we move on through, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about on this. Um, as far as um, reproducing, it needs about 13 hours for it to reproduce, sporulate, and then become um, or infect um, a plant. And once it does that again, it's, it's just going to keep, keep the process going. So you can see this, what it looks like on cabbage. It can be pretty detrimental early season. And again, we're going to call it leaf blight, um, stem blight. You can see there too. Um, one way to um, not have an issue with this is to make sure you, you plant resistant cultivars. And again, maintaining adequate potassium levels is going to reduce the occurrence of this. Um, proper plant spacing. Of course, now we're getting into the one that none of us likes to see on our tomatoes. We talked about this a little bit last week, but this is early blight, which is actually um, Alternaria solani is the, is the Latin name for that. And you can see that bullseye appearance is what we call concentric rings. So if you see a spot that has those raised bullseye rings with a yellow halo around it, then that's indicative of, of early blight. Um, and, and we call it early bite because typically it shows up a little bit earlier in the season. Um, not much of a curative fix for that. It does start at the bottom of the plan and work its way up. So that's another indicator. But once you see that starting to happen, you've just got a few days, you know, to, to get control of that because it can be pretty devastating quickly. Again, not a, not a curative fix for that. You can see how these leaves or spots here start to coalesce together and no photosynthesis can take place on that and eventually that whole plant um, will die. Whoops. And just another picture there. I threw a few more pictures in there because the best um, preventative thing we can do here, and we'll talk about this at the end as far as control, but is getting those preventative fungicides on. And um, especially in a, a week like we had last week, of course, tomatoes aren't to that size yet that we would start making those applications, but we want to get a preventative fungicide spray on there to prevent this. Because again, there's no, no cure. There's not any amount of fungicide that we can apply once we get to this stage. Uh, we need to do it beforehand. Powdery mildew, this is another biggie that we see pretty prevalently. Um, it's also, um, a water-loving pathogen. Uh, it looks like you've gone out with a flour shaker or powdered sugar and just coated those plants. Uh, and again, this is one that's going to attack the older leaves first, so, but usually this white coating is going to be pretty indicative. So, especially when those uh, leaves start turning yellow and crinkling up, what we call the burn back, uh, it's usually going to be too late to do anything for them at that time. But uh, this, this is something we're going to see earlier in the season and then later in the season because it's going to thrive in that 60 to 80 degree mark. So if someone said today it was 91 degrees outside. So that's not going to be um, as good of an environment for this uh, to reproduce. But once it gets started, it will flourish. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. It can be 32 degrees or it can be 96 degrees and it's going to flourish once it gets started. So keep that in mind. And just another picture there of what that looks like. Uh, we'll have folks that will get this confused with downy mildew. They are a little bit different because the downy is going to grow only on the underside of those leaves. So usually with downy, um, we'll see these little yellow spots start appearing. But the pathogen itself is on the back side of that leaf and it's going to look a lot like the front side of that leaf. Powdery can grow anywhere. 
And of course, downy's gonna lack that silvery appearance as well. You can see how it's gonna be a little bit more speckled. Uh, we can have both on a plant. You're not gonna be limited to just one because you know, this, this is East Tennessee. We're more prone to these fungal organisms. So uh, the, the bad thing about this is that um, if you get it and you got a neighbor that's growing squash or uh, watermelon or cantaloupes, pumpkins, then they're probably going to have it too because the spores just flow pretty freely um, through the air and of course are driven by, by water too. This is another one that's uh, a soil splash can be detrimental. So again, I'm just going to keep saying that, making sure we get some kind of mulch cover on that bare soil in our, in our garden is really going to prevent a lot of these things. And again, you can see what those spots look like. We're starting to get a little necrotic tissue right here starting to eat through the leaf but that's what it looks like on the underside you can actually see that um, that mold growing and you've probably heard of this on uh, some of our ornamental plants annual plants impatiens and, and begonias uh, petunias will even get um, downy mildew but it'll just keep spotting that plant up and then you can see it as it kind of merges out to the end of that plant, it'll start coalescing. So that's why it's real critical to get um, a control on there pretty quick. Um, this is basil, so we can see it. It can be very devastating in, a, in, a, um, in your basil. Uh, we, we saw a lot of that year before last, and you can kind of see what the progression is of that. It's also detrimental to hops. If anybody's growing hops, if it gets started early, it can colonize and, and essentially just destroy uh, the cone before it becomes fully developed. All right, septoria, we've actually uh, already seen this in the county. Uh, it looks a lot different from alternaria, and you're probably saying you're crazy. They all look like spots to me. And they do, but uh, septoria is going to have smaller spots than the alternaria. You can kind of see how that looks like. We still get that uh, yellow, but the spots themselves are going to be more of a water-soaked spot. They're not going to have that bullseye appearance. So if you go out there and you see spots without the bullseye, without those concentric rings, it's just a spot. These leaves are not that anything's just a spot, but it's just septoria. And we'll usually see that. Um, in conjunction with early blight. And again, that's why oftentimes you won't hear us necessarily differentiating between the two because we are going to treat them the same way. And you can see there, it's got a little bit different uh, fungal organism. That's what we call the sphygmidia. That's how it reproduces itself. Um, and once that spore body releases, that's how it releases all those spores in the air. And again, wind carries it, water carries it. That's why we really encourage crop rotation. Uh, and I'll save that toward the end, but again, you can kind of see the difference in those spots a little bit there. You'll usually have more yellowing with early blight than you will with septoria. All right, and thracnose. This is another biggie we see here. And you can kind of see how that uh, fruit just gets like a sunken, circular, dark spot. And you can't really see this because it's on a red pepper, but there's a salmon colored mold growth that's right there. That's how we know that's um, anthracnose because we'll always have that little salmon color there. This is one that's going to thrive in humid conditions, so it can usually be prevalent throughout the um, entire season, but if we're picking um, at um, adequate intervals and not letting that fruit ripen uh, beyond picking time, then usually um, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, residues, if you do get this, moving that plant material, if you get a really bad infestation and burning that material is a good way to get rid of that. Uh, you can see what those lesions, what those spots are going to look like on the fruit. This is a pumpkin. You can see how it's kind of sinking in and it looks almost like warts a little bit rising up on, on the fruit itself. Uh, so again, it's something we're going to see all throughout uh, the season. And the other bad thing is when we see this, this doesn't look like it's opening up a point of entry, but it can. It can open up the skin, make it softer and more susceptible for insects or other uh, diseases to penetrate. Um, it even affects spinach and of course uh, tomatoes. 
And this is a really bad case. So if you see this, I mean, that's something for the Guinness World Book right there. Hopefully we never see nothing quite that bad, but you can see that ugly salmon colored growth and now it's just turning black. Um, I'm not sure what plant this was, but I popped this in here because it's got those salmon colored lesions. So you can actually see that a little bit better, but anytime you see that color, usually that's gonna be indicative of anthracnose. Then we have Botrytis. This is one or two that also is going to favor wet weather. We'll see this early in the spring with our strawberry crops because it does like a little bit cooler environment. We'll also see it on some of our, our caneberry crops and also within grapes and and actually um, even with tomatoes and um, any of those crops we're growing in a high tunnel or in a greenhouse and I guess maybe as extension agents, we get snobby because we say if we see this like in a greenhouse in a management system like that, we'll say that that's just a, a disease of bad management because it, it can be managed through cultural practices. But um, gray mold can lead to pretty significant losses. And again, if you get this started, it's really hard to, to get control of it. Um, oftentimes, some of these below ground um, root crops, we're not going to necessarily see it until we're harvesting, but you're always going to get this dark gray brownish discoloration that almost looks like um, late blight. Uh, the, the bad thing is that Botrytis can overwinter in the soil, so this stuff right here is what we call mycelium, and it can just lounge around there in the soil for any amount of time, and there's also fruiting bodies associated with this too that will also take up residence in the soil. So anything uh, from your flip-flops to a tiller, uh, tomato steaks in your, in your garden have the potential to spread that disease from um, one garden bed to another. So, you know, this is one of those we don't, we don't want to get in our soil. Uh, kind of ranks up there with um, the, the late blight, southern blight. Once we get those organisms in the soil, it's really hard to get rid of those. And again, it's going to be active in those lower temperatures, but once it gets started, it can run rampant. As far as management, we'll talk more about these a little bit later, but um, looking at resistant cultivars, making sure we are buying certified uh, clean seed and, and transplants, uh, cleaning that equipment, whether it's pruning shears, our knife, um, our garden hoe, our tiller, you know, make, make sure that if, if we're sus suspect of any of these type pathogens, to make sure we're cleaning that. And make sure we do that at least once a year, and we'll do a whole nother class on that sometime in August or September. But um, providing proper drainage and aeration, uh, we don't want to let water just stand and be stagnant. Uh, same way we want to have uh, proper plant spacing to increase that airflow. And, and crop rotation, that's going to be a biggie along with cover crops that can help reduce the occurrence of, of these. Fungal organisms is going to be the one uh, category that we can control with um, chemicals, with pesticides. There are many um, effective fungicides, although many of those are going to be more preventative in the way they respond rather than curative, so keep that in mind. Our main goal is to keep all these things from becoming an issue. So as far as uh, viral infections, those are not going to be living organisms like fungi and bacteria. Uh, they're actually um, composed of clumps of protein, basically. I probably don't need to talk about viruses since we have all become very uh, knowledgeable <laughs> on that subject in the last four months. But um, basically, they're just large molecules and they're multiplying inside those host cells. So um, many Scientists think that they were just wayward genes that, that got loose, um, basically. Others think that they were once pathogens like fungi and, and bacteria, but then realized that they could get um, a host to do everything for them. So they got lazy, basically, and just started living off of somebody else. So uh, viruses are going to be really small. We're not going to be able to see those with the naked eye, but they are going to have some unique symptoms that are going to tell us that it's virus rather than bacteria or fungi. So this is how we can kind of start sorting out uh, some of these these issues. So uh, when we see some of these kind of markings like this mosaic pattern, pattern or ring spots or even these um, 
what we call intervenal chlorosis. So you can see the distinct veins there, but you get this unique coloring or pattern. Um, anytime we get some color breaking that starts to occur, leaf distortion, usually that's going to be indicative of a viral issue. And, you know, there's not much that we can do with viral issues. But some of the most common are going to be uh, seen on beans and any of our cucurbit vine crops and then tomatoes with the tomato spotted wilt. So this is actually a squash that has or a zucchini with two different types um, of virus, which they're kind of cool looking when you see them growing in the wild. They can be pretty prolific, but it's a zucchini a yellow mosaic and then it's a watermelon mosaic. So we'll see this one right here quite frequently on watermelon, hence the name. And then this is tomato spotted wilt. And you can kind of see how this is actually vectored by thrips. We're going to talk more about that, but it's got this really unique, unique mosaic pattern. And tomato spotted wilt is going to be vectored by these uh, fringe winged thrips. And you never want to see these in your garden because they can wreak havoc. So uh, they basically look like little worms with legs, I guess is a good way to uh, illustrate them. But um, females don't need a male to reproduce. So basically what they do is go in and create a little slit inside the leaf tissue to lay their eggs. And they can usually lay about 25 to 50 eggs at a time. And so once those hatch and they mature to adulthood in about three weeks, then they start the process all over. So you can see where I'm going with this. They can be very prolific. And um, once we get a, a population of those, it's gonna be really hard to control because you know we're not gonna control tomato spotted wilt virus with a, a pesticide we need to be or a fungicide we want to control what's causing the problem which would be the thrip well thrips are going to be hard to control because they're such a fast moving insect so it's going to be hard to get, get good coverage coverage on those um oftentimes we'll get asked how do you know if we have thrips because this is obviously a really blowed up picture but if you take a piece of just white paper and go out and or a, a white sheet towel or something like that and just shake your plant then they'll fall down on that white paper and you can actually see that they look like little worms with legs and you can see the fringe um, un with a little magnifier like i said this is one we we don't want to invite him in because it'll spot up our leaves um, it affects um well there's, it affects a lot of our solanaceous plants, but then there's also plants that are going to serve as host plants. And that's not just within our garden. So a lot of our ornamentals and even weeds are going to contribute to the, to the issue here. So um, peppers, po potatoes, um, eggplants, all of those things are going to be a little bit more sensitive uh, to the tomato spotted wilt virus. Peppermint is another, if you grow peppermint in your herb garden, um, begonias, impatiens, all of those are going to be susceptible to this little booger. Uh, there's not going to be any treatment for tomato spotted wilt. The only way again to control it is to control the, the, th the thrips. But again you can see that unique color pattern. So if we see that, uh, we know that's not a disease, that what it is, it's a virus, but it's being spread by, by insects. And usually another um, indicator if we don't have fruit to be able to tell us, it almost looks like a fusarium wilt. When they get a, when you get a bad infection, only one part of that plant will grow. It's like the other side just quits growing, if that makes sense. So that's another way to, to kind of tell. It'll just one-sided growth. Again, practicing good weed control. And I know some of you on here are not going to like me saying this, but dandelions, chickweed, um, sow thistles, buttercups, uh, plantains, and I say that to, to me too because I utilize some of those in, you know, making salves or um, pestos and things, but all of those are going to serve as a host plant for this thrip that can vector tomato spotted wilt. So um, it's, it's a hard one to know where that threshold is. That's just something you'll have to, to determine. And again, it, it is going to affect peppers, and then tobacco and peppermint. All right, as far as management of viruses, 
Y'all notice there, there's no chemical control. It's all going to be, um, we're going to have to be self-reliant. And again, that's where those resistant cultivars come in. So we have a, a lot of cultivars with 100% resistance to this. You've just got to read the, the seed pack. And actually in your packet tonight, you're going to get that chart that's going to give you resistance for many different cultivars um, in Tennessee. Uh, clean seed and transplants again, good sanitation and controlling those vector issues and that's just going to be reducing those weed seeds. Uh, bacterial infections, of course, now these are going to be the ones that require that film of water to be able to reproduce. Um, you, you're going to hear us talk about natural openings for bacteria to invade. So um, fungi that can actively invade any of that leaf tissue, um, bacteria is going to require some kind of wound, um, some kind of insect. So there again, you can see why we, we don't want those issues in the garden, but they're going to have to have that along with the film of water to be able to in invade, to have that point of entry. Uh, the cool thing about bacteria is that you can put a little drop of water on the stem and or take a stem cutting and drop it in water and if you get these little striations out like this that start flowing out of that then that means that it is a, ba a bacteria you'll actually be able to see that with the naked eye which is pretty pretty cool um, again just the, the spread of this um, can be carried by material or, or plant material, equipment, uh, seed and soil. Seed's going to be your safest source. Um, for, for that, it's, it's a very low, I think it's less than 5% that we're going to get seed contamination um, of this. But um, this little guy here, he's really pretty, but he's a red banded leaf hopper and can actually vector um, bacterial wilt in oak trees. So some of those large, magnificent oaks that we've seen dotted along the countrysides are being plagued by those leaf hop hoppers that are um, vectoring that, and there's nothing we can do for those. So um, to go along with that in the garden, bacterial wilt is one that we more commonly see with our cucumber crops. Um, I would like to burn every uh, spotted and striped cucumber beetle from here to kingdom come because I cannot get control of these populations in my garden. So uh, th this is again going to be vectored by the cucumber beetle. We start out with plants getting this what I call the droopy loop and uh, when I see that it just breaks my heart because I know there's not much I can do at that point. But basically what happens is those beetles are picking up bacteria while they're feeding on other infected cucumbers and then they're going to transfer that to a healthy cucumber in the same manner. And then what happens is that bacteria resides in the gut of those beetles. Uh, and it just is a never-ending saga, basically. So you start out with that little droopy loop, and then it gets a little progressively worse. It almost looks like you've poured scalding water on it. it starts getting, affecting the stem, and then we almost, I got my pictures reversed. Then we get total dieback. But um, this is the spotted and striped. You can see what their size looks like. You can see some of their feeding damage. And again, this sign right here, it's only that one leaf crop the rest of that picture out, but um, usually that's how it, it starts. But we end up with this, and that's not where we want to go. But when we do see this, when we start seeing that droopy loop on the plant, um, there's nothing we can do at that point. The best thing to do is quit harboring safe refuge for the beetles and get that out of there immediately. Um, burn that plant material, if at all possible. And nobody likes to do that, but that's just... The reality of it. Now if any of you attended my companion plants class and you heard me talk about some different cultivars that you can plant that will kind of help resist, not resist, uh, suppress some of the populations of these. So um, they'll go feast on specific cultivars and leave you uh, your bush picklers that you can make for bread and butter pickles. So sometimes you've just got to reach a reasonable compromise I guess but uh, you'll also see the um, this as well but typically we we see the striped and spotted 
Another bacterial disease we see is scab, but we don't see it until later in the season when we've dug our potatoes. Uh, this is one that when we uh, have that pH in the soil where it needs to be, unfortunately can lead to this demise. Um, no way around that because we, we need to have the pH optimum for um, the plant to be able to produce tubers, but this can be an issue that we see. The prevalence of this is going to be higher if we plant in furrow um, really wet, heavy clay soils. Uh, you'll tend to see this. Now this is still edible, it's just ugly and it's uh, for maybe some of our produce stand folks or farmers market folks, it might not be sellable necessarily, but you can eat your way around that. But uh, that's why when we're growing potatoes, those first two to six weeks are going to be really critical when they're starting to set tubers. We want to keep good, even, uniform um, moisture um, on, in, on the furrow, on those potatoes during that time. And then once they start um, filling out and we, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Goodness gracious, Melody. All you Melody's on here, help me out. <laughs> Um, anyway, when they reach harvestable size, then um, of course that's when we're going to see the issue and it's going to be detrimental, but we don't want to be pushing water when they start dying back, when the vines start dying back. And again, they just get that little warty, knobby-like appearance, um, but 100% edible. But just always being aware, conscientious of when you're planting, uh, we just don't want it really super wet. Uh, those heavy clay soils can be detrimental to, to potatoes. Um, bacterial soft rot, this is the last one I want to talk about in bacterial. Um, it's just caused by another fungal organism that loves wetness, which is Erwina. Um, it, it's going to be common with our brassica crops, so think about um, cabbages and broccoli, your kales and spinach, collard greens, all of those. You're going to get these um, dark mushy patches along the stems. You're going to start seeing this little bit of a droop. Um, I, and again, water splashing from that soil is going to be the biggest culprit to invite that in. We don't always see that with carrots and, until it's too late. But the thing about um, bacterial soft rot is that some of our tools, our implements that we're using in the garden, can introduce this pathogen. So that's again why we need to be dis disinfecting tools, uh, storing those properly, um, and making sure we manage, especially if we're going back and forth between even garden beds at our, our house. And you can see this almost resembles some other uh, diseases we've talked about tonight. It almost looks like sun scald a little bit, and there could be a little bit of that going on there. Uh, but it does have the bacteria. You can see where it's wrinkling right here to make me say that in that tan leathery appearance. But you've got some mycelium, um, not mycelium, you've got some soft patches here where um, that pathogen has just been introduced and probably got insect feeding on that as well, which is another issue with bacterial diseases. They're either going to be vectored by an insect or they're going to invite them in as a secondary host, which just leads to prolonged confusion in the garden. And this is, um, this almost looks like a stem canker or the damping off that we were talking about, but that's a full size uh, potato. So we just get that soft rot right at the stem level. But the thing with soft rot is that it's going to affect all parts of the plant. But this is just showing you a close up of what that looks like. As far as the bacteria, um, most bacteria are going to decline without any host because they're going to be reprodu reproducing within that host plant. So how long they um, live within that host is just going to depend. Some are going to reproduce pretty rapidly within the soil. Some are going to build up populations in the host plant and then they're going to decline in the soil. So it just depends on which organism that we're dealing with. But the, the main thing is we don't want to take a, a chance with these. We want to, again, practice good sanitation. Um, make sure we're doing everything right before we even set that first plant in the ground or sow that first seed. And I know I'm speaking a lot of this to uh, in-ground, but this, this can also affect anybody growing in raised beds or containers too. As far as bacteria, we've talked about all of these. Um, 
pretty much with, with the others. As far as chemical though, you'll notice there that we've got limited options. And we do have copper listed here because copper can, can be a gardener's best friend. Some of those organic compounds like um, copper, lime sulfur, um, all of those are, or immunox even that we use in fruit trees. They can stimulate the immune system of our plants kind of like a maybe a booster shot for a vaccination. Uh, I don't know if that's a very good analogy, but hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going with that. It, um, it just kind of beefs up maybe vitamins, use it as a synonym for vitamins. It's just beefing up our immune system to help, help those plants be able to resist some of these stressors. So, Okay, so by this point, y'all are probably thinking, oh my Lord, she is crazy. I have no idea what she's talking about. She's just talking about all these leaf spots and she's just throwing all this stuff at me and I cannot get all this stuff in my head, right? So probably several of you are just like, okay, so what next? You've thrown all this stuff at me, what do I do? So some of you have heard me talk about uh, pest ID is gonna be critical. So you've kind of seen some of those differences between just environmental stressors, physiological responses, making sure our soil pH is right, um, knowing what insects are going to vector specific diseases, knowing what these fungal pathogens are. There's a lot. There's a lot to it. So how do we grow a garden, know what we're dealing with, and, and how to solve those issues? So um, knowing what we're dealing with is, is the number one step. I mean, that's, that's what we've, we've got to do first. And I tell gardeners all the time, make, make sure that we keep a journal from year to year. Um, it doesn't matter if you've been a gardener for 20 years, 50 years, or you're just starting. If you invest in a journal that's got a calendar in it, um, document the issues that you see throughout the season. And of course, this year is a little different. We've started noticing that trend in the last few years that we can't predict some of these um, issues like we used to be able to just because of um, the climate and things like that. But nonetheless, if you're documenting this, you're, you're going to kind of be the beginning plant detective in your own home garden, maybe without even realizing it. So, you know, I, I kind of approach this from what I do in my own personal garden or on the farm. Uh, some of you know that I grow tobacco. So, you know, I know to, tomato spotted wilt virus is an issue that we see with, with tobacco, but I, you know, I know timeline. I know what, when I'm going to see specific insects and disease at, at certain times throughout the growing season. So I document that, you know, I'm looking for insects, I'm looking for damage, you know, I just don't pass by or walk by the garden's edge, I actually get out there and I look, I investigate, you got to look underneath the leaves, especially as we get into the season, because, you know, squash plants have great big old leaves. Well, if we get downy started, we're not going to know that unless we get down and, and actually look up underneath that, that leaf. Um, document and weather patterns, kind of keeping a timeline of that, uh, knowing if you've been wa um, watering or maybe even overwatering. watering. Um, vacation sometimes can throw us a curveball if we're gone for an extended period of time. Knowing uh, what those physiological issues are. You know, when you see something in your garden, go back and pull this PowerPoint out, pull some of those pictures out and look, because some of that might just be environmental stressors. Um, again, just looking at weather um, conditions, you know, I can't stress that enough. I, I know that things that Mother Nature has given us in the last month are things, especially in landscapes, that we're not necessarily going to see until six months out. Now that's going to be different for a garden, but still we're going to see some of those issues. We're starting to see them now and we're going to continue to see them through the growing season. And when I say, well now this was because of this three or four months ago, I get a lot of crazy looks from people and I'm like, no, seriously, it's just it's just how that pathogen reproduces or how it got its start and how it flourishes. So um, anyway, just knowing what those are, keep those documented. Sometimes it could be wildlife injury. That's happened more than once. You know, you'll, you'll think you've got a disease and um, it can just be wildlife. And we can even lump slugs into that category. We can lump them into insects, either one, you know, but, but sometimes they can be a little uh, mysterious in the way they gnaw on our veggie leaves. So um, also think about fertility issues. We've all been guilty of it. We'll do a soil test right before we go plant the garden and make an additional lime, but maybe our, uh, you know, it rained and we didn't get our pre-plant on and, you know, there's just all kinds of things that can happen. So if, if we're managing that soil and, and 
know where our pH is at and you know know where our MPK is at, know what we need to be adding and not adding, um, then we can suffer less occurrence of some of these um, pest issues. So anyway, we're, we're gathering the facts. We're just being our own little detective. And again, just looking for symptoms and, and you know, signs and symptoms, looking for those clues. Um, I often say you'll just oftentimes have a gut uh, suspicion as to what it is, um, especially when it comes to the blights, early blight, late blight, southern blight. You know, oftentimes we'll be, we'll have that little nagging feeling that we, we kind of know that it's going to be bad or maybe something that we can't necessarily control but uh, again when we're looking for clues look for signs of a fungus look for some of that mycelium or fruiting structures you know fungus are going to give it away a little bit better than um, bacteria and, and virus but you know again virus you can see what looks like virus right here so we we might actually even have virus uh, bacteria and fungi all on that same plant uh, the other critical key is first thing in the morning is usually the best time to be able to see some of these things because uh, we've gone through an extended period of, um, well, nighttime. Let's see, do I have a picture of that on here? I think I do have that in a minute. But um, that water, whether it be dew or fog, um, has settled on those plants. And then those plants are actively you know, transpiring through the day and, th and even through the nighttime. So um, if they're reproducing, then we're more apt to see that first thing in the morning with that sheen of water on those plants than, than later in the day as the sun dries those out. Uh, bacteria, we can't see um, that with the naked eye, but we can see remnants of it or it can you know, give us a little bit of a clue. Uh, bacterial ooze, we'll sometimes see that or oozy sap. You can see that on that pear tree. Um, oftentimes we'll see that on fruit tree bark. That's a good indication of that. But no matter what we talk about, the main thing is knowing that prevention is going to be the best line of defense. And it's really simple to do that. Um, it, again, just understand the basic manifestations of how these organisms work um, gives, you know, knowledge is power. It gives you power over those pathogens. So, you know, fungi and bacteria, um, they're going to move really slowly throughout the plant. So if we see this early enough, again, go back to early blight, when we start seeing those few little bullseye spots and, a, you know, concentric rings show up on the bottom of that plant, what we call firing, then that is a light bulb moment. Okay, I need, I need to do something. But you should have already had some preventative uh, material on there anyway. But if you're getting to that stage, uh, some is better than, than none at that point. Because basically we can slow that organism down at that point before it just continues to keep spreading. But now when we look at a virus, um, they're going to spread systemically throughout that, that plant. So that's going to make them a lot more difficult to control. That's why we say there is no control for those. So when they first enter that cell, they're basically beginning to spread any adjoining cell. So again, think about, I guess, COVID-19. So what happens is they move into the phloem of that plant. That's how they become systemic, called xylem and phloem. You know, that's what's moving up down that, the pythium of that that plant. So then they start appearing in the roots and they're being transported back up um, to these young leaves. So that's why viruses are going to be so hard to con control. And again, viruses are going to be spread from plant to plant, whether that be us as a vector, um, machinery that we're using, any kind of insect, um, and then of course vegetative propagation and seed. But this is the least way. I only put that in there because just to make folks aware that, you know, certified seed is clean. It's certified disease free uh, for a reason. So we have a, a reduced risk of some of those things occurring throughout the season. Um, so that brings us to the point of integrated pest management. We've talked a lot about some of these, but how do we merge all these together to be able to, to have a disease free, pest free garden. Well, it's combining those elements of cultural, biological, and sometimes chemical warfare, I guess, if you will, in, in the garden. So um, we don't like to 
and master gardeners that I, I train will tell you I, I don't I don't like it when somebody calls in here and we just throw a chemical at them right out of the bat. You know, we need to have a conversation with folks. So that that goes for us. We need again go back to that journal. We need to kind of talk to ourselves. Okay, so what about this? What about that? Do I really need to apply a chemical? Um, you know, that's kind of the path of least resistance. You know, so what are some of these other things that we can do first? And then if we do apply a chemical, are we going to utilize a conventional or an organic compound uh, to do the deed? So cultural, in my opinion, and oftentimes in some of those leadership trainings some of you have been on, you hear me always utilize the term creating a culture. So I use that here too to just say that we, we want to increase our, our cultural control and increase a culture where we don't allow pests to come in and invade our our turf. So um, eradication is going to be hard to do, but if we are going through um, the garden, you've heard me kind of allude to this a couple times tonight, uh, a few minutes ago when I said about bacteria, um, bacterial wilt being vectored by um, cucumber beetles. If we go through and rogue those plants and destroy those plants, you know, that's helping us eradicate um, that disease. Now it's going to take time, but as long as we're continually doing that, then we're reducing um, we're reducing the pathogen. So go back to that triangle. Um, pruning, and this can work in garden setting or, or fruit trees. When we're pruning, that's actually sustaining the life and health of that, that plant over time. So that's always a good practice. Um, at the end of the season, when the garden is done, move, remove everything. All those tomato stakes, whether they be metal tea posts or old tobacco sticks, the pie pans to scare the birds away, any of the string that you, you know, tied your tomatoes up with, whatever's in that garden, make sure that you're cleaning all that debris. Um, use that time to go through and mix that Clorox um, solution up, 10 to 1, Clorox and bleach. Sanitize everything at the end of the year. Uh, Make sure that any weed host that we have that we're, you know, eradicating those in the process. Tillage, that's a touchy issue for some. Some don't want to till, and there's good and bad to that, but because um, tilling, of course, can bring up lots of weed seeds, but um, it can also disrupt the, the soil tilth. But at the same time, it can also help with some of those soil borne diseases, especially if we're tilling deep. Um, it can push some of that material down deep to where our plants can't reach those. Um, and some people will utilize soil solarization or we're moving more into strip till, no till, whatever. We don't want to leave that garden area bare because actually crop rotation and cover crops are going to help us eradicate some of those pest problems. Um, avoidance, we want to avoid conflict, right? So one way to do that is helping reduce pest spread. And again, these are things I've already talked about tonight, but making sure that we give um, plants room to breathe. So if that means going from five zucchini plants in the garden down to three, that's better because you're more apt to have a higher yield anyway. Spacing those out properly, then instead of putting them on top of each other, that actually reduces yield uh, when we do that. So um, make sure you look at plant spacing. Don't crowd anything. Let there be adequate Airflow. Airflow is going to help with insects. It's also going to help with, with diseases. Intercropping just means that you're growing um, two or more crops simultaneously in that same area. So when you're growing tomatoes, plant basil. So use some basil seeds in between. That's, that's one way to look at that. Or sowing radishes throughout the season. Um, it can be an understory plant, if you will, to your, your peppers. Um, growing nasturtiums in with your cucumbers, you know, including some of those things because um, you, you're getting away from those monoculture crops. So even in the garden, if we've got five or six, seven different crops, even if we start adding flowers and things to the mix or herbs, then we're increasing that diversity, which can confuse insects, invite the good ones in, help reduce uh, some of the disease pressure. Uh, mulching, that one speaks for itself. I've said that uh, many times tonight, make sure that we, we don't have bare ground on there. Number one, that's going to reduce that splash contact. Um, any of these pathogens we've talked about, most of them are going to require water for reproduction or movement. 
in some shape, form, or fashion. So um, mulching is also going to help us conserve moisture. It's going to help us conserve those soil temperatures. Um, and that is going to be good for the long-term sustainability for the garden. Irrigation, uh, the big thing there is just not to overwater. Invest in a system that you can run drip tape or that you're watering at the soil line somehow. Um, same in pots. Don't go out there with the squirt gun in your pots or your raised bed and just squirt. Um, number one, you're wasting water, but number two, um, just inviting pathogens in. But make sure you you water deep, point that water where it needs to go. And fertility, I can't speak to that enough too, because adequate nutrition, whether it be NP and K, making sure that we get that lime application if we need it to adjust our pH, but also making sure that uh, we pay attention to what our plants are telling us in regard to maybe some of those secondary nutrients like blossom in rot um, with, with the calcium, or even some of those um, viruses that we looked at, some of those mosaic patterns also mimic some of our um, secondary uh, toxicities and deficiencies um, within our nutrients. And oftentimes that's just going to be driven by pH, which is ultimately really cheap to uh, to fix. So if we start out of the gate with a heavy growing medium, whether that be in ground, pots, raised beds, then we're going to reduce a lot of occurrences um, of these things from happening. Now we can't control mother nature and all the things that she throws at us in regard um, to water um, or a lot of these organisms that um, float by the wind or float by water, that's going to be hard to control. But still, we can we can lessen those occurrences. Um, as far as irrigation, not watering um, late in the evening because that's just going to maintain that wetness throughout the night and that's just going to harbor um, those pathogens and, and lead to reproduction. Uh, we don't want to water um, in the later part of the morning as that dew is drying off. Whoops, where'd it go? Yeah, good timing. You can see where we're at there first thing in the morning. Um, resistance, we, we've talked a little bit about that in regards to resistant cultivars, um, but the, the reason all of that come to be was because of insects um, building resistance to certain chemicals. So probably one of the best examples I could use would be the Colorado potato beetle. So, you know, 20 years ago, or well, okay, longer than 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, you could go out there and sprinkle with some seven dust and control your Colorado potato beetles. And then uh, we started using some stouter chemicals to be able to control them because that wasn't working anymore. And uh, it basically got to the point that Colorado potato beetles would just stand up and laugh at you if you went out there and even tried to control them with anything. I mean, they, you know, they were resistant to everything. And so that was one reason that we saw the need for resistant cultivars. So that's why a lot of those were created. And then it was also at that same time, the need for um, rotating chemicals was so important. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But again, when you are utilizing chemicals or when you are planting in the garden, look at resistant cultivars and then also um, rotate your, your chemicals as well. Maybe that sounds confusing right now, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, biological controls, we talked about this a couple weeks ago in beneficial insects. You know, these, these are things we like to see because they're going to come in and, and take care of some of those bad bugs for us, but um, they're very effective, but they're going to be hard for us to predict unless we're growing um, a biodiverse ecosystem in our garden. That's one way that we're going to invite these um, seraphid wasp and tachnid wasp and things like this into our garden. Um, but again, um, they're going to be hard to, to predict. And once their food supply is gone, then they're gone as well. So it's, it's kind of like being a monarch way station. It's one of those things we're going to have to maintain over time. We don't just do it once. Um, as far as chemical control, uh, you'll notice there I've said that several times. Viruses are going to be hard to control. The easiest are going to be those blights and, and leaf spots. Um, those leaf diseases are going to be easiest to deal with just because leaf um, leaves are thin. 
You know, think about the leaf structure. So even if pathogens are inside those leaf tissues, it's going to be easier for any chemical to penetrate that versus the bark of a big old tree or any kind of like stem canker or trying to drive fungicide down into the to the soil. You know, on a commercial scale, there's products that can do that. But when we look at it from our perspective as home gardeners, it's going to be a lot harder for us to do that. So that's why the, the, leaf, um, the leaf is so much easier. So when we get into chemicals, we talk about protectant and penetrant or systemic fungicides. Just a few things to point out there because, yeah, I'm running out on time. Um, protectant, you need to get that material on before an infection. You're going to have a broader activity spectrum. So if you buy a fungicide broad spectrum for your garden, then you're going to be able to use it in your landscape, in your orchard. Um, it's, I'm not saying that these are safe, but they're going to wash off more easily by rain and they're going to re require a shorter application interval. Uh, those systemics, you're going to have a narrow activity of, of spectrum and they're going to wash off um, less easily. They're going to stick to that leaf surface a lot longer, uh, but they're going to give you more time in between. Um, protectants are going to have multi-site mode of action and when we talk about rotating chemicals that's what we're talking about is rotating the mode of action uh, you're not going to have as many problems with those resistant strains whereas systemic they're going to they're going to kill a, an insect or a disease by one mode of action and that's where we can get into creating um, resistance um, as far as sanitation, again, we've talked a, a lot about these, making sure that you in, inspect your plants, disinfection, uh, removing any litter, cleaning up the garden. Um, I think I've spoken to all of these, but again, just making sure we're fertilizing and lime is directed a little bit more will not do you any better. Same way with chemicals. If it says one teaspoon per gallon, then don't put two because that can cause phytotoxicity, cause stress on that plant, and invite more pathogens in. Um, so be careful with that. Um, res yeah, resistance. So if we can, again, utilize those cultivars, then that's going to be the best thing. If we're saving seed from heirlooms from year to year, then it's going to be especially important for us to make sure that we keep a, a clean garden as much as possible because those diseases, some of those diseases can carry over in the seed. So we want to be real careful with that. If we have uh, tomatoes that have a really heavy infestation of anthracnose or alternaria, then we don't want to save seed from that that plant because we're just going to be causing us an issue from from there on out. Uh, rem remember that chemical control that's our last ditch effort that's when we're going to utilize those when other strategies fail or are not available. Um, remember that fungicides are going to prevent not cure. Um, apply when those conditions are favorable. We here at the office we will send out an email and let you know hey we just had our first diagnosis of early blight start making applications. Um, and then of course rotating. So I've said that several times tonight. You're gonna to get this um, publication in the Google Drive, but just to show you what's in there, uh, you're gonna get the material here, and we're gonna talk about just a few of these before I let y'all go tonight. But you're, it's gonna tell you over here in the comments if it's organic, how to use it. You can see there, chlorothalonil, best used as a protectant. So some really good information in there, along with what diseases that it's gonna control. And that's just a second page for that. Uh, you'll also get this handout. And the reason I put this in here was just to show you that some of these diseases, we're going to recommend the same materials, even though it's different causal organisms. So you'll get this for all vegetable crops that you can refer to as well. Um, I often get asked questions about specific chemicals. So um, as far as fungicides, this is Mancozeb. That's the active ingredient. Sometimes you will see it sold as manzate or dithane. Um, manzate, a bag like this, will do um, a, a long time, and they're broad spectrum. Again, you can utilize them um, elsewhere in the in the garden and landscape. Um, but but again, this is going to be um, a fungicide. We can use that as a preventative. Now, wait a minute. Let me go back here. So. This here is actually an ethylene uh, carbamate based. It's going to be uh, low solu it has low solubility in the soil and in the water, so it's going to break down quick. So you're not going to have a lot of residual there. This one is uh, all four of these contain chlorothalonil as the active ingredient, and that's an, 
organochlorine. So it's non-systemic. So remember, it's going to get washed off pretty quick. So that's why we say spray intervals of 7 to 10, 7 to 14 days on, on those. Um, this mode of action is just messing with the enzyme function um, of the fungal diseases is what it's doing. So when I talk about rotating chemicals, I don't want you going out there if you're applying these fungicides. Say we, we get notification of early blight. Don't go out there and immediately hit it with Manzac. Go out there and maybe add um, a preventative of one of these broad spectrum, the first couple applications, then come in with Manzac. Rotate those chemicals too. If you're gonna be applying those throughout the season, rotate those chemicals. So invest in one of these and then invest in one of these. And then the cool thing about either one of these slides is that you can mix with um, a broad spectrum insecticide like seven. So you can mix those in the, in the same sprayer. Uh, to take us on a step further, these were the ones I was talking about from an organic uh, perspective. Uh, copper is real good uh, to control um, mildews. Lime sulfur, we usually don't use that except in orchards. Of course, sulfur, that helps raise pH, but it also can, can help turn on that immune system of plants. There are some fungicides that are organic. Serenade is going to be one of those. It's an organic um, biofungicide. It's going to be a preventative, though, so you can't use it as a curative. But it's the bacillus, kind of like Bt is uh, bacillus thuringiensis is the insecticide. This is the equivalent for the fungicide. Uh, bacillus... Um, ugh, um, Bacillus subtilis, I think is what that's called. Um, Agrifos is phosphoric acid, um, also used as, a, as an organic compound. And then neem oil, the cool thing about neem, um, it's broad spectrum, you'll see here fungicide and insecticide. Um, it's actually uh, di um, distilled from an evergreen tree in India that they refer to as the Indian lilac, which is um, in the same family as the mahogany tree, just as an FYI. So that's where that derivative comes from. So just in summary, uh, when we look at disease, um, when we are thinking about diagnostics, we want to make sure that we gather the facts. Number one, uh, look for those clues, identify your suspects, and then if need be, send those to the lab or bring those into the extension office or send, send us an email, give us a call, let us look at those to make sure you don't have anything major. Um, I didn't put Southern Blight in the presentation tonight, but you know that's one that we, we definitely want to get documented if you see that. We don't even want to be growing in that same field for, for years to come. Um, but, but make sure you get proper ID, whether you're doing that yourself or sending it to, to one of us in the extension office. Um, and, and that way we can get the proper steps to controlling the issue. But of course, uh, when we talk about management, we're going to use that integrated approach always. We're going to use cultural and biological and chemical means as necessary. And those are just going to help us reduce and or eliminate um, by reducing or eliminating the, the factors that are contributing to that disease triangle. So that is all I have for y'all this evening, which is probably enough. Y'all let me talk way too long. <laughs> Do I have any questions? It's a lot of information. But as always, there's going to be a lot of notes in the, in the slides, so make sure that you, um, you refer to that as well.